Okay, we're done. So let's welcome Bernard Gabor. Bernard, uh, can you unmute? Yes. Hello. Hi, I'm, am, am I pronouncing your name correctly, by the way? Yeah, it's Bernard Gabor. But... Okay. <laughs> Right, so uh, Bernard is, is working for Bloomberg and uh, he's going to talk about virtual ENV, uh, rewriting and re-releasing it. So please uh, start your screen sharing and then we can move ahead. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen share at this point. Uh, yes, it's working fine. Second. Okay, so let's start, go ahead. So hello, I'm Bernard Gabor. I'm gonna be talking to you today about rewriting and releasing virtual env. And this will be basically, what did I learn while I tried to do this ambitious project? So the first question we need to answer is what is virtual env? And for those of you who might not know it yet, virtual env is a tool that allows you to create Python virtual environments, okay? And what is a Python virtual environment? It's basically a Python executable that behaves as it would be a separate Python installation, separate from your system one, that is. So what does this mean? It means that packages installed into this virtual environment Python will not affect the system Python installation. For example, if I create a virtual environment, you can see the CLI comment for it there. And I basically, install a package into it. I can do this even if I don't have administrative rights to install packages. And the tool will be happily invocable from within the scope of that virtual environment. And everything works as just as it would have been installed into the system Python otherwise. So the really important thing about the virtual environment is that other than the isolation that it provides, it behaves exactly in all, almost everything just as the system Python would behave. For example, you can see here, if I printed out the information about the Python environment and I create a virtual environment of it, what I get back is the version information and is the same down to the last byte, okay? So, virtual is fairly popular project, has been around for the last 13 years, but just to quantify how popular is, I use this PyPI info powered uh, query to find out just how many downloads did the project had in the last year or so. And basically the, for the virtual and project, this means around 0.8 terabytes for every 12 months. So if I plot the re results that I got back, it's basically this graph. You can see that it has on a daily basis around 300,000 downloads and per week, per month, and which basically, sums up to around 120 million installations per year. This is installation from the PyPI uh, index server. It doesn't necessarily include installations from mirrors and whatnot. But the important thing is this is that it be at the moment around the 66 most popular Python project. So as you can figure it has, it is very widely used. So doing any kind of changes to the project is always kind of problematic. Now, one thing that this talk is not gonna be about is what are virtual environments in depth, meaning how do the virtual environments actually work? If you want to get a glimpse into that, how do virtual environments actually work and how Python itself achieves creating these isolated virtual environments, I invite you to see my talk from last year's EuroPyCon, which I linked in here. And there you'll find all the necessary information that you might want about that. But focusing on the, the, this today's talk, it's gonna be mainly about the virtual and project rewrite. And before we go ahead, I would just like to clear up one thing is that when we talk about virtual environment creation tools, it's not just virtual amp that is around. We also have the VM module, which is part of the standard library as of Python 3.3 and is defined per that PEP 405. And you can use both of these tools to create virtual environments. So just to clear up things, what is the difference between the two projects? Well, the difference between the two projects is that besides just virtual and being created 10 years before VM is that the virtual env is a third party package. And this means that you will actually need to ins install it and manage the installation separately of your Python installation. 
Well, with the VM package, it comes with your Python installation. You have to do nothing, just install Python and you have it already available. And this is also an advantage as it is advantage, depending from where you look at it. The positive is that in case of virtual and project, if you discover a bug within the project, getting that fixed can be a very quick turnaround. You can feel a bug, a pull request, and maybe in a day or two or later, you already have, can have a release that contains the fix. While with in case of the VM project, if you find a bug, you may may well need to wait months in best case, but even years in the worst case, just to get that bug fix in, because you need to wait the entire Python release cycle to get the fix. And not just the C Python release cycle, but also your operating systems release cycle. So another big difference is that virtual have also supports Python 2.7 while VM only supports Python 3.3. So if you need to create virtual environments in Python 2.7, your only bet is to use virtual. And virtual and itself supports PyPy and C Python. So in case of any other interpreters, we're not able or flavors will not be able to create virtual environments. However, this is not the case with the VM projects because given that you have an interpreter implementation which satisfies version 3.3 or later requirements, it should already be supporting the VM project. Now the first four bullet points I enlisted here are basically things that were true before the rewrite. As this talk alluded to last year, there has been a virtual AMP rewrite. And while we did this rewrite and release, virtual AMP got a few additional differences, a few additional benefits that are true today, but were not true a year ago. One of the things is that the virtual AMP project is much more configurable, meaning that you can configure not just uh, the command line arguments, we can configure the tool not just through command line arguments, but you can also configure it to our environment variables or user configuration files. And you can use these configuration files, for example, even to alter the default values for virtual amp, giving you a lot of power. For example, if a broken pip gets released, you can easily use this configuration file to pin to an older pip version. Similar is, similar, the same thing cannot be said about the VM project. Another thing is that the virtual AMP project is extensible. It has a plugin system, meaning that you can support additional functionality to this plugin system, functionalities such as supporting activation script for additional shells, supporting additional Python flavors. For example, if you want Iron Python virtual environment creation, you can write your plugin for virtual AMP, which allows you to create Iron Python virtual environments or Rust Python or whatever else there might be. And the VM is only extensible through by extending the base class. This is a bit tricky because if you extend the base class, you do not necessarily get the same command line interface. You have to redefine the command line interface again. Now, and finally, probably the biggest or more impactful difference from day-to-day -day usage for the average user is going to be performance. The virtual env allows you to create a virtual environment in less than half a second, while with the VM, this usually takes two seconds or more. And this is in the happy case that you're running on a Linux operating system where this operation is faster. Multiply this by a factor or two or so on Windows. Okay. And a final additional benefit of virtual environments that the virtual environment actually has a rich API, means that if you use it from Python to create a virtual environment, you get back an actual Python object on which you can query information such as, hey, what is the Python executable created? What is the location of that? What is the location of the site packages folder? Or what is the Python interpreter version? And that kind of information is very much available on this result object. And this is something that can be very, important if you're writing a tool that wraps around virtual env environment creation. Okay, so just to start, uh, <clears throat> now that we have VM as part of the standard library, do we still need virtual env? And my answer to that is I do think we need it. The way I see it virtual env is that virtual env is basically the place where we can innovate and improve the virtual environment creation ecosystem. And we can try out things basically check things if they make sense. And in case they do make sense, we can talk about then porting them to the VM project and then getting it out of the box. However, the VRTLM project on itself 
provides additional benefits of like better performance, better API, better extensibility. And these are kind of like uh, bullet points that are very important if you're writing tools around Python environment management. So for those projects, virtually will be very much the go-to project. Okay, so now let's focus on actually the rewrite itself. So the first thing that we need to cover is why we decide to rewrite. And just a small caveat, if you're wondering, the dog in the picture is my dog. It's a small Yorkshire Terrier called Silky. So let's move on. So the, one of the biggest reasons why we decided that we needed a rewrite of the project is a lot of old paints. And these paints were basically that the virtual amp project, as it was a year ago, was basically a single thread project, which has spurious if as branches, but spread around a thousand lines of code. And to make things worse, the test suite only covered around 60% of the line coverage, and we're not even talking at this point about branch coverage. So you can imagine from this that maintaining the project was very cumbersome. Basically, I think any kind of change to the project meant that you are not really sure if that change is not going to break the world. And it was kind of like a lot of iterative process that we fixed around, waited a few weeks. If no one responded, the, no one submitted any kind of like issues that, hey, you broke me. Then we're like, hmm, that was a safe change. But we have no certainty around this. And also had a rudimentary plugin system. In theory, it had it made it possible to extend the virtual and project, but the way it did it is basically a plugin, a pure man's plugin system, meaning that it had various comments within the code. You can basically inject your own code into that code, code sections. This made it both that it had a plugin system, but it was very hard to use. So very little people actually used it. And this meant that in practice, when other interpreters wanted to add any kind of functionality or people, they tended to add this functionality straight into the core project, which made it even harder to maintain, because especially given that the low confidence value we had in actually that things are not gonna break once we do add some new lines to the code base. And finally, another thing was that there was a lot of things that a lot of things were designed 12 years ago or so, meaning that a lot of the design choices within the code base were based on the fact what Python offered and allowed 12 years ago. Python got a lot better and smarter throughout the last 12 years. So now we could actually have much cleaner, much nicer solutions for a lot of the problems in there. So that being said, the rewriting virtual AMP wasn't something that we just came up last year. It actually was something that's been around at least from 2014 or so. And there has been at least two attempts, both of them and halfway through. And before we jump into it, trying to do our own rewrite, it's important that we understand why those project fails. And looking at them, I think they mainly fade because the virtual AMP environment creation in essence is deceptively simple. And the important thing is deceptively, because if you actually go into the depths and start doing it, there are a lot of nuances and edge cases which are gonna make your life really difficult and bitter. And it's also very hard to test because you basically need to, need to support all possible platforms and environments. So it's very hard to even set up a test environment just to make sure that all the Python versions work correctly, work nicely. And it, it, it just practically very hard to do this. So given this, this, I jumped into the project myself basically by around 2018. But before that, I was a tax maintainer since 2017. And those of you might know that Tux is basically a test suite runner, meaning that it manages setting up and running your tests. And part of the setting up your test suite is also creating a virtual environment, installing your project into that, and then running the test suite. And a lot of the bug fix bug uh, reports that we got in Tux were related to the virtual AMP because the Tux tool was urging the virtual AMP. And because of this, I started to interact more and more with the virtual AMP code base to the point where in 2018, I actually became a maintainer of it. At this point, the project was basically very much in an abandoned status. And in 2019, I got to the point where I wanted to attempt the rewrite of Tux itself. And the reason for this is that 
talks one of the major concerns that people were reporting to Tux is that hey Tux is very slow. So I started to investigate why is Tux slow. What I found out is it is that a lot of the slowness of Tux actually comes from virtual virtual environment, and that is the virtual environment project itself. Because the creation of the virtual environment is slow, the API flexibility provide information we need to provide to the test suite runner. So we need to make additional sub process calls that take extra time, or that the interpreter discovery happens both in Tux and virtual lab. So at this point, I was like, okay, it seems like to make Tux faster, I need to make virtual lab faster and better. So I paused my rewrite on the Tux and I started doing the virtual lab rewrite. So given that two people at least already filled out this project, I set up a plan and the plan basically went around first identify what are the components within the virtual env project, what are the sub components, the sub segments that can be separated from within the code base and came to the conclusion that there are essentially four different kind of main sections within the virtual env project. And the first section is the creator. The creator is something that given a system Python provides you a virtual environment of that Python. Now this Python is very raw, doesn't have any package installers, anything like that. It's basically just a Python environment that's isolated from the system Python. Now the next thing is the seed mechanism. Having a virtual environment without being able to install packages into it is often not that useful. So it is very important that once we create a virtual environment, we create it with a pip setup tools packages within it so that users can actually start using that virtual environment and install additional packages into them. And this kind of like process is what we call seed mechanism. If we seed some packages into the virtual environment creation so that users can then install additional packages into that project. And there's a third component, which is the activators. A virtual environment is already usable if you just basically pass in the Python executable. Like if you type in envbin Python, it's gonna work magically, but users tend to use it more from the CLI. And in the CLI, it's easier just to type in Python rather than the full path your virtual environment. And for this reason, we're using activator scripts. The activator scripts are small scripts which are specific to your shell you're using and basically alter your shell that when you type in Python, instead of invoking the system Python, it's gonna invoke the virtual environment Python, but it's even more generic that it's gonna also, for example, when you type in pip, it will also invoke the pip from within the virtual environment rather than the system Python, okay? And this is the activators part. And finally, is the interpreter discovery. And the interpreter discovery is important mainly for supporting uh, cross Python environment creation, meaning that, as we said before, in order to use virtual and project, you have to install it. And in case you want to create a virtual environment, in case your Py system has two Pythons, for example, Python 2 and Python 3, you want to create a virtual environment with both two and three, it's helpful to be able to need to install it just in one. For example, you can just install the virtual and project in Python 3, but still be able to create a virtual environment in Python 2, even two, even though you're not actually have virtual and installed into that Python system Python. And it's even more specific. It even allows you to, for example, to be very broad about what Python you require. For example, you can specify as you see here that, hey, I want PyPy 3.6.9 slash 64 bits and the virtual and project will look out on your machine, find if there's any interpreter available on that platform that satisfies that requirement. And if it is, it's gonna be able to create a virtual environment of that, okay? So this is, again, it's just a quality of life improvement that you, don't have to basically memorize where are your virtual environment or where are your Pythons installed on your machine. And it still allows you to create them just by specifying a few, by typing in a few Python specifier string characters. So the first thing when starting to do a rewrite of a project is to actually decide what we you're gonna continue to support. And in case of the virtual amp, what we decide to continue to support is basically we wanted to support this kind of cross version creation that I just described in the previous slide. We also wanted to keep supporting Python 2 for once because we want to support 
end of life pythons a few years post their actual end of life just to ease that transition of these pythons for people because version is going to be the last project they're going to be able to drop similarly we we also support pypy and until pypy supports python 2 we we'll still need to support python 2. We also want to support a no install use, and this is something I'll get into a bit later. But basically, you should not need necessarily be able to install virtual to be able to use it. You should be able to just download and run a virtual package or kind of like an RD defect. Okay. So then we decided the next question is what we want to add. And we, what we wanted to add as a new functionality was extensibility. This is the plugin system so that additional Python interpretation can provide their virtual and implementation outside of the core virtual and project. We also wanted to provide the rich API so that tools that wants to wrap around virtual and can get information about the created virtual environment very easily. We also to wanted to unify the virtual environment creation sex mechanism. And this is something that a lot of you might not know, but actually before the rewrite, the old virtual env created virtual environments in one way, while the VM uses the tool for a different way to create a virtual environment. And the reason for these two discrepancies is because virtual env was created back in the days before VM. So the it had to kind of like monkey patch Python to be able to support virtual environments. But with VM, the virtual with VM project, the C Python interpreter itself added a lot of mechanisms that make it makes it a lot easier to create a virtual environment. Then also decided what we're not going to support. And whenever you decide something you're not going to support, it's very important to provide the alternative path to the users. For example, we decided that we're not going to support relocatable virtual environments. And the reason why we did not support this is because getting relocatable virtual environments correct is very hard in cross-platform support, like if you're targeting all platforms. And this is something that we try to do. We kind of like support it for, or in an experimental state, we supported within the virtual project for a few years. But we always got a lot of bug reports. So with the rewrite, we decided to let people say, hey, try to provide this functionality as a plugin. And if it is a plugin, you can actually scope it so that it's very, very narrowly scoped and it only supports your platform. And there you can ensure that actually things gonna work. Another thing that we decided to drop is drop all the deprecated flags because the virtual and project has a lot of deprecated flags that were introduced like 10 years ago, we wanted to drop it. Now, naturally, once we did this, and especially after the rewrite, people started creating issues on our environment, on our issue tracker that, hey, why did you drop this? It just disappeared. And we just had to point them out that, hey, this is something that was deprecated a few years. Please just remove the flag. Everything should work just as fine as it did before. Or basically, we also wanted to drop the having the entire project in one file. And the reason for this is was that we're actually get to a state where virtual env is easier to maintain and reason about it and test. So, and also we wanted to drop std lib only dependencies. We actually want to pull in Python environment, Python ecosystem dependencies. So we don't have to rewrite and maintain a lot of functionality within virtual env, functionality that's already available as a PyPI package. So, in order to, once we had kind of like the rough plan, what we want to support, what we don't not want to support and how we're gonna go ahead, we posted an RFC in our GitHub and we let people get back to it. It was generation, it was in general positively received with a few additional changes su suggested on it to the point where I was like, hey, we are ready to do this. And I, as you can see here, I basically was very optimistic it was, hey, give me a month and I'll be ready with this. Fast forward six months later, it's six months later, basically I got to the point where I was ready to have a first review request. This is when I basically posted the information to some Python package uh, authority maintainers and hey, look at the code base, make, let me know if this makes sense and it's kind of like works. I got back some review. On the review, I got back, I made some few iterations. And on the January 21st, we got the first beta. The first beta allowed users to actually test it themselves on a machine without needing to install it from like a Git repository. And this got a few more 
feature request, bug request suggestions. We apply that to release the second beta to the users. So the users can again test it. And after the second beta, we did not get much more feedback. And part of it is that people who were interested in actually being guinea pigs were kind of like covered their use cases. So on January 10th, we basically went on the first public release. That being said, just to speak a bit about the people who made this possible. For the first release, it was basically Sidan Kumar helped migrating the activation script from the old virtual lamp to the new virtual lamp, but otherwise everything else was done by me. But once the project got public, people started to look at the code base and made a lot of uh, suggestions and improvements and pull requests. And this is kind of like the list of people who contributed to the rewrite of the project. With, this, with the number of lines they've changed through the project. And then before we actually did the release, it was very important that we publicize that this is gonna happen, this re-release, so that people can be prepared for it. And we did it on the Monday so that people actually have time to address it. And first we made a Python discourse uh, package in the packaging section a forum post where we explained in detail that why did we re rewrite, what are the new features. Then we send this down onto the distributors mail list, followed by the actual release happening to the PyTI package. And at this point, people could actually try it. Anyone who did not version constrain or version pin virtual lamp started to get it. So the issues and the feedback started to pour in. Another of the things that we did is I made a Twitter post about this, which got fairly popular and actually got a lot of impressions. So people could know about this through Twitter too. And in the next section, I would like to describe a few technical gutchas. These are a few things that we learned by doing the rewrite, things that we got us a bit unexpected, just to eliminate a few things which you might run into when you try to do a rewrite. So one of the things that we should always do when you do a rewrite is consider people stuck on old versions. Some version people could actually not uh, use the new version, not because they did not want to, but because their platform doesn't allow you. So always provide a way them to support them. And the way we did it is uh, keep the code that we had on a legacy branch. And this legacy branch keeps getting, also is released as a documentation, as a new tag, but also as a, the new changelog at the end of it points to the legacy changelog. This was suggested some by someone so that someone looking at the new changelog can see how the new changelog transitions to the old one, just to see the full life cycle of the project and keep releasing uh, community patches even after the release. You can see that two weeks later, we still the release, which basically fixed a few compatibility issues with the new virtual end. So the C Python, another lesson learned was that the C Python interpreter is very diverse. And what it means by it's very diverse is that when you say what is a Python installation and you look at your operating system like the path structure, you are used to a given structure, but this structure is very diverse and actually it actually varies between platforms because every platform that releases CPython can customize it. This is, for example, what is the configuration script on my platform. You can see that, for example, that the pure lib is under the lib folder, but the platlib is under lib64. So the bottom line is that if you get an installation of Feather and Ubuntu, they might look have a totally different file structure just because the when those distribution decided to redistribute the Python. They decided to use a different folder layout. So this is one of the main things that made it very hard to use, uh, to support the uh, virtual amp in the older basis, because we did not basically use this information, the configuration information available under the sysconfig package, but instead try to do if else branches to guess what is correct for the current platform. We switched this to the sysconfig one, which made it that now we have much better support for various redistributions of the C Python. And for example, on the side of Fedora, you can see that the lib64 and the lib has separate side packages folder. And this is in line with what is the expectation on those platforms for a virtual environment. Another of the things that is that the Linux distributions that also does other custom For example, Debian does not install VM by default. 
And there goes our assumptions from earlier that VM comes out of the box. It comes out of the box unless you're on a Debian distribution such as Ubuntu. But more importantly is that the pip uses this to tears path to install. And this is basically the same configuration I showed you on the earlier side, but is a separate, it's basically duplicated, duplicating the sysconfig. And for example, the Debian patching of this uh, had different patching for the distributed and the sysconfig configuration map. And so we had to pick one of the two, which one to use. And we went with the distributed one, mainly because pip uses it. And because pip install, uh, users install packages into the virtual environment using pip, that's what is what people would actually expect. Okay, so another kind of uh, gotcha was that uh, long-term support uh, distributions. For example, CentOS ships with pip the later or the oldest long-term support CentOS distribution ships with pip nine, so that it does not. It's so old that it does not understand Python requires on Wills. So it basically struggles to install our Python way or our Python wheel of the project. And what we had to do to work around this is we had to like not use the latest available sticks within the project and instead vendor this into our project and also provide additional better message in the set of that file so that people trying to install virtual on the CentOS can get a more useful error message and rather than something very cryptic, which leaves them baffled. Another kind of like a gotcha was that the Mac, I told you about the ability of the user that, hey, the operating system that they can customize the layout of a Python installation. It's even more, for example, Mac OS has even more Python installation and they customize even further. You can get the Python from the Python work or PyEnv, but you can have a Python on Mac OS from the part of the operating system. You have a brew installation from where users may be able to get a Python. You also have the Xcode developer tools, both for Python 2 and Python 3, from where users may get a Python. And for all Apple shipped Pythons, they are hardcoded to static pack. This is kind of like for security and safety reasons, but means that basically if you take a Python executable provided by the macOS system, you can just copy it and use it again. You have to mangle the binary so that it thinks that it's in the correct location it allows to run. And this kind of like operation is basically things that complicate achieving a rewrite because getting to support all this platform means that you have to have custom code to support every little of this kind of distribution. And through that, some of these are actually not shipped by Apple, but the fact that some user somewhere might have available on their machine means that they're gonna create an issue. So you'll have to support that some level. Another kind of like issue was that the fixing these tutorials, some of you might not know, and this might go away once these tutorials moves out to the standard library, but these tutorials actually allow you to customize your actual prefixes. For example, you can customize where your binary should be placed in into like a static path. And this is done through some configuration files. And the problem is that if users set these configuration files or even your operating system ships with this configuration file, it affects also your virtual environment. So we basically had to monkey patch kind of like this distributed package so that it ignores these configuration files because otherwise what you ended up with was that you installed the package and it installed into the system environment rather than the virtual environment, just by the fact that the distributed could pull in in a virtual environment the, the global configuration of it, okay? And yeah, we this was very hard to track that and done it entirely. We had to close re, close and reopen the issue five times. So just be tenacious about fixing box. You'll get there eventually, but be prepared to be frustrated while trying to actually do them. Another kind of like issue we run into that is similarly in the same uh, scope is like the Windows Store Python. Some of you might know that Windows now actually ships the Python interpreter part of the Windows Store. This is very convenient for the user to install. However, it needs to satisfy the restriction of the Windows Store Python. And these kind of restrictions are basically that you can, uh, you can run these paths, but you cannot read it. And this can end up in surprising behavior. And this is something that can tickle off your, uh, put you off of the balance like expectation. For example, if you expect that the six executable always exists, you may end up in some cases it does not exist. And in this case, you have to make the decision, do you want to support this platform or you just wanna display a meaningful error message for the user and encourage them to upgrade to a newer version that maybe has this kind of functionality fixed. 
Another kind of thing, uh, lesson was learned that the PyTribe project is maturing. They're very quick to answer. However, the, a lot of the platforms, for example, Mac OS and Windows are not well tested. So while we try to do the implementation, we try to keep the functionality on par with CPython. And while trying to keep the function on par with the CPython, discovered a lot of bugs in their VM project, reported them, and most of them has been actually fixed by now. Another kind of like a gotcha is that on Python 2, yeah. On Python to actually create a, on Python to to create a virtual environment, you have to use the os.py file. And oddly enough, this Py might actually be missing. This is a landmark file to see Python interpreter to detect where is the operating the standard library actually exists, where is the prefix of the Python installation. And this there's a valid reason for this Py to exist. And for once it can actually Python can function without it. And for second is that you, if you remove all the Python file and you just keep the compile file, you get obfuscate the source code and maximize your storage availability or storage. For example, this can be useful on a Docker image or something. And you should be able to still support creating virtual environments even when you don't have the Python file available. So we had to like fall back to only fall back to only having the OS.py, the compile file. So basically having a Python interpreter with just this and just avoiding the OS.py. Another kind of thing that was into it is that the seeders and the seeders is basically, as we talked, is what's going to allow you to install packages. And in the old system, what happened that we basically took the Python or the pip wheel and put it onto the Python pipe and that asked that pip to install itself. Now this is slow because pip is a general purpose install tool. Some of the avoidable overheads are that wheel validation, startup time, self upgrade chat. This is the kind of functionalities that you don't actually need in case of this use case because we ship the wheel ourselves and we know it's correct and we know it's that everything's gonna be fine. So what we did is basically added now a new see the functionality called app data. And what this app data does is basically allows you to cache as much as operations as possible. So that subsequent, subsequent virtual environment creations have to do as little work as possible. For example, we put everything that is cacheable within the app, there's platform specific application data location, and we cache both the wheel validation, the extraction of the wheel, generating the PyS file, fixing the records, basically doing most of the installation that's do avoidable, we cache it into the app data so that when we actually have to do a subsequent virtual environment creation, we don't have to do this all this step, but instead we just have to copy or sim link to the pure lib folder of the new virtual environment and generate the console scripts. This means that instead of having to spend like uh, four, three, two seconds to do a provide this seed, inform, seed package, you can don't be done in literally like 100 milliseconds if you use sim links and half a second if you use like actual virtual, if you use copy method. So another function that was how should the packages be updating? And you have two options. Either you're gonna be always keeping it to the latest best or you're gonna be keeping the version that you shipped virtually with it. And this is quite divisive because it depends on what you prefer. Do you prefer convenience and ecosystem evaluation or you prefer speed and stability for your project? And what we ended up doing after a long discussion is that we basically on a middle ground where we use the last 20 or 20 or days older Wheels only. So we auto upgrade, but we only use it if it's new enough. This means that the projects have a great period when they can actually fix any bugs that they might have. Okay. Now, one of the things that we all did not expect, and it's kind of like a gotcha, is that it could be that the user application that is not writable. So we need to be able to fall back in this case to something same to so still not fail. And another kind of like things to lessen here that be friendly with your redistributors. Basically, we identified the path that we needed to what power the parts that our redistributors wanted to actually patch to alter. And we made it simple and easy for them to do this by understanding why they need it, make it easy for them and document it where and what should be patched when they're gonna alter the functionality. And here's where I talk about the download only mode. And the download only mode is basically something that's gonna similar functionality as you can install pip with just downloading and then invoking Python. You can also just basically download the zip up that we created and then just install that zip up or just invoke that zip up by passing it to your Python environment. 
Okay. Now I'm gonna skip this because I don't. Uh, yeah, there it is. So yeah, so one of the additional functionalities that we had to we added now that we actually can add additional functionality on top of the virtual event creation. For example, we could uh, fix upstream bugs before they actually made it into were fixing the upstream. In this case, stripping the PyM launcher on macOS, or for example, automatically generating a git ignore file into the virtual environment to stop them being committed to your version control into your GitHub. Okay, and be prepared to do releases, but whenever you do a release make sure that you're around in the next hour or two so that if anything major breaks you can easily and quickly fix it and just to conclude everything up what we learned is that when you try to do a rewrite always have a well-defined delivery plan test a lot automate a lot with cis and prepare for a lot of bug fixes on short turnaround we basically had 27 releases in five months to the point where now virtual is basically stable we don't get any more bug fixes but in the first two months there was quite a lot of work involved in it. Always be available past release and be ready to predictly reevaluate things in your project and see if you can do it better today if you would actually do it all over. Okay, but in general, be nice. And whenever someone does a rewrite, try to approach it in a very understanding fashion so that you don't get to the section where people are basically frustrated when they try to do something good and just because you get something that you get they do something that you don't like you're getting nasty and discouraging them from contributing to the open source python ecosystem okay and just to say virtual MB is still going very well we got a bit of bump but otherwise we're in a good state and that was all for my talk um, I'm not sure if I still have question time left, but if not, just drop chat questions into the chat. Okay, that was a very, very intense talk. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bernard. So we have uh, three questions, I think. Uh, virtual end requires the Python version you want to be created in already. In yes, it does require. You can select an arbitrary Python version and have virtual end download and install it. Is there other I can't hear you, Mark, if you're muted or something, but. But to answer that question, because I understand most of the question is that it, it's true, you can't have basically arbitrary Python installation. Now, nothing stops you, for example, to writing a version plugin that actually will download it's not available. And this is possible. For example, you could write a PyM virtual and plugin that actually uses PyM to download and install a Python version if it's not available on your machine. Uh, okay. I can't hear you, Mark. I'm not sure if that's my side or your side. Okay, I think I'll just take, pick the questions into the QA on, on the Zoom and I'll answer those. So the next question is, uh, was this work done on your personal time or your work time? If the deleter, how did you argue for business to be allocated for such fundamental work with little business gains? So it was done both during my personal and work time. It was basically, let's say, there is kind of like something as 20% time or whatnot. So I did it part of my work time during this my 20% time. And it was considered basically as my personal development. That's how the business signed off on it for me to work on it. And the third question that we have is basically, will the new version of virtual and be included in the standard library in the future? I don't think it will be included as one and one, but I think what's going to happen is that parts of it that turns out to work a lot better in virtual env will be back upported to VM. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's all for me.